show horror hunt today at horror hunt we bring to you a book written by someone who i guess most of you know he is a great children's story writer and most of all he is the world's best storyteller yes today we bring you a book written by roald dell the book today we are representing is named Boy. Boy is actually not a fictional book, but a book Roald Dahl wrote about his childhood. Although he totally claims that it's totally not an autobiography. Well, we'll soon find out about that, wouldn't we? So, what are we waiting for? But wait. First, we must hear a few words from the author himself. So, without further ado, let's start Boy by Roald Dahl. An autobiography is a book a person writes about his own life and it is usually full of all sorts of boring details. This is not an autobiography. I would never write a history of myself. On the other hand, throughout my young days at school and just afterwards, a number of things happened to me that I have never forgotten. None, none of these is important, but each of them have made such a tremendous impression on me that I've never been able to get them out of my mind. Each of them, even after a lapse of 50 and sometimes 60 years, has remained seared in my memory. I didn't have to search for any of them. All I had to do was skim them off the top of my consciousness and write them down. Some are funny, some are painful, some are unpleasant. I suppose that is why I have always remembered them so vividly. All are true. Rural Dell. Starting Point Chapter 1 Papa and Mama My Father Harold Dell was a Norwegian who came from a small town near Oslo called Sarpsborg. His own father, my grandfather, was a fairly prosperous merchant who owned a store in Sarpsborg and traded in just about everything from cheese to chicken wire. I'm writing these words in 1984, but this grandfather of mine was born, believe it or not, in 1820, shortly after Wellington had defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. If my grandfather had been alive today, he would have been 164 years old. My father would have been 121. Both my father and my grandfather were late starters so far, far as children were concerned. When my father was 14, which is still more than 100 years ago, he was up on the roof of the family house replacing some loose tiles when he slipped and fell. He broke his left arm below the elbow. Somebody ran to fetch the doctor. And half an hour later, this gentleman made a majestic and drunken arrival in his horse-drawn buggy. He was so drunk that he mistook the fractured elbow for a dislocated elbow. Well said, put this back into place, he cried out, and two men were called off the street to help with the pulling. They were instructed to hold my father by the waist while the doctor grabbed him by the wrist of the broken arm and shouted, Pull me in, pull, pull as hard as you can. The pain must have been excruciating. The victim screamed, and his mother, who was watching the performance in horror, shouted, Stop! But by then, the pullers had done so much damage that a splinter of bone was sticking out through the skin of the forearm. This was in 1877, and orthopedic surgery was not what it is today. So they simply amputated the arm at the elbow, and for the rest of his life, 
My father had to manage with one arm. Fortunately, it was the left arm that he lost, and gradually over the years, he taught himself to do more or less anything he wanted with just the four fingers and the thumb of his right hand. <coughs> he could tie a shoelace as quickly as you or me, and for cutting up the food on his plate, he sharpened the bottom edge of a fork so that it served as both knife and fork all in one. He kept his ingenious instrument in his slim leather case and carried it in his pocket wherever he went. The loss of one arm, he used to say, caused him only one serious inconvenience. He found it impossible to cut the top of a boiled egg. My father was a year or so older than his brother Oscar, but they were exceptionally close. And soon after they left school, they went for a long walk together to plan their future. They decided that a small town like Sarpsborg in a small country like Norway was no place in which to make fortune. So what they must do, they agreed, was to go away to one of the big countries, either to England or France, where opportunities to make good would be boundless. Their own father, an amiable giant nearly seven foot tall, lacked the drive and ambition of his sons and he refused to support his tomfool idea. When he forbade them to go, they ran away from home, and somehow or other, the two of them managed to work their way to France on a cargo ship. From Calais, they went to Paris, and in Paris, they agreed to separate because each, each of them wished to be independent of the other. Uncle Oscar, for some reason, headed west for La Rochelle on the Atlantic coast while well, my father remained in Paris for the time being. The story of how these two brothers each started a totally separate business in different countries and how each of them made a fortune is interesting, but there is no time to tell it here except in the briefest manner. Take my uncle Oscar first. La Rochelle was then, and still is, a fishing port. By the time he was 40, he had become the wealthiest man in town. He owned a fleet of trawlers called Pashures the Atlantic and a large canning factory to can the sardines his trawlers bought, brought in. He acquired a wife from a good family and a magnificent house as well as a large chateau in the country. He became a collector of Louis XV furniture, good pictures and rare books and all these beautiful things together with two properties are still in the family. I have not seen the chateau in the country but I was in the La Rochelle house a couple of years ago and it really is something. The furniture alone should be in a museum. While Uncle Oscar was bustling around in La Rochelle, his one-armed brother Harold my own father was not sitting on his rump doing nothing. He had met in Paris another young Norwegian called Adnason, and the two of them now decided to form a partnership and become shipbrokers. A shipbroker is a person who supplies a ship with everything it needs when it comes into port. Fuel and food, ropes and paint, soap and towels, hammers and nails, and thousands of other tiddly little items. A shipbroker is a kind of enormous shopkeeper for ships and by the most impo far most important item he supplies to them is the fuel on which the ship's engines run. In those days, fuel meant only one thing. It meant coal. There were no oil burning motor ships on the high seas at that time. All ships were steamships. And these old steamers would take on hundreds and often thousands of tons of coal in one go. To the shipbrokers, coal was black gold. My father and his newfound friend, Mr. Adnison, understood all this very well. It made sense, they told each other, to set up their shipbroking business in one of the great coaling ports of Europe. Which was it to be? The answer was simple. The greatest calling port in the world at that time was Cardiff in South Wales. So off to Cardiff they went. These two ambitious young men carrying with them little or no luggage. But my father had something more delightful than luggage. He had a wife 
a young French girl called Mary who had recently married in Paris. In Cardiff, the shipbroken firm of Addison and Dale was set up and a single room in Butte Street was rented, rented as an office. From then on, what we have, we have what sounds like one of those exaggerated fairy stories of success, but in reality, it was the result of tremendous hard and brainy work by those two friends. Very soon, Anderson and Dell had more business than the partners could handle alone. Larger office space was acquired and more staff were engaged. The real money then began rolling in. Within a few years, my father was able to buy a fine house in the village of Landaff, just outside Cardiff, and there, his wife Mary bore him two children, a girl and a boy. But tragically, she died after giving birth to the second child. <clears throat> when the shock and sorrow of her death had begun to subside a little, my father suddenly realized that his two small children ought at the very least to have a stepmother to care for them. But as more, he felt terribly lonely. It was quite obvious that he must try to find himself another wife, but this was easier said than done for a Norwegian living in South Wales who didn't know very many people. So, Wales, so he decided to take a holiday and travel back to his own country, Norway. And who knows, he might, if he was lucky, find himself a lovely new bride in his own country. Over in Norway, during the summer of 1911, while taking a trip in a small coastal steamer in the Oslo Fjord, he met a young lady called Sophie Magdalene Hesselberg. Being a fellow who knew a good thing when he saw one, he proposed to her within a week and married her soon after that. Harold Dell took his Norwegian wife on a honeymoon in Paris and after that back to the house in Landa. The two of them were deeply in love and blissfully happy. And during the next six year, years, she bore him four children, a girl, another girl, a boy, which is me, and a third girl. There were now six children in the family, two by my father's first wife and four by his second. A larger and grander house was needed and the money was there to buy it. So in 1918, when I was two, we all moved into an imposing country mansion beside the village of Radir, about 8 miles west of Cardiff. I remember it as a mighty house with turrets on its roof and with majestic lawns and terraces all, all around it. There were many acres of farm and woodland and a number of cottages for the staff. Very soon the meadows were full of milking cows and the styes were full of pigs, and the chicken run was full of chickens. There were several massive shire horses for pulling the plows and the hay wagons, and there was a plowman and a cowman and a couple of gardeners and all manner of servants in the house itself. Like his brother, Oscar and Lara Chill, Harold Dahl had made it in no uncertain manner. But what interests me most of all about these two brothers, Harold and Oscar, is this. Although they came from a simple, unsophisticated, small-town family, both of them, quite independently of one another, developed a powerful interest in beautiful things. As soon as they could afford it, they began to fill their houses with lovely paintings and fine furniture. In addition to that, my father became an expert gardener and above all a collector of alpine plants. My mother used to tell me how the two of them would go on expeditions up into the mountains of Norway and how he would frighten her to death by climbing one-handed up steep, up steep cliff faces to reach small alpine plants growing high up on, small, uh, on some rocky ledge. He was also an accomplished wood carver and most of the mirror frames in the house were his own work. So indeed was the entire mantelpiece around the fireplace in the living room. A splendid design of fruit and foliage and intertwining twining branches carved in oak. He was a tremendous diary writer. I still have one of his many notebooks from the Great War of 1914 to 1918. Every single day during the 
I was five war years. He would write several pages of comment and observation about the about the events of the time. He wrote with a pen, and although Norwegian was his mother tongue, he would always wrote his diaries in perfect English. He harbored a curious theory about how to develop a sense of beauty in the minds of his children. Every time my mother became pregnant, he would wait until the last three months of her pregnancy and then he would announce to her that the glorious walks must begin. These glorious walks consisted of him taking her to places of great beauty in the countryside and walking with her for about an hour each day, so, so that she would, could absorb the splendor of the surroundings. His theory that was that if the eye of a pregnant woman was constantly observing the beauty of nature, this beauty would somehow become transmitted to the mind of the unborn baby within her womb and that the baby would grow up to be a lover of beautiful things. This was the treatment that all of his children received before they were born. Chapter 2 Kindergarten 1922 to 1923 age 6 to 7 in 1920 when i was still only 3 my mother's eldest child my own sister astri died from appendicitis she was 7 years old when she died which was also the age of my my own eldest daughter olivia when she died from measles 42 years later astri was far and away my father's favorite he adored her beyond measure and her sudden death left him literally speechless for days afterwards. He was so overwhelmed with grief that when he himself went down with pneumonia for a month or so afterwards, he did not much care whether he lived or died. If they had penicillin in those days, neither appendicitis nor pneumonia would have been so much of a threat, but with no penicillin or any other magical antibiotic great cures, Pneumonia, in particular, was very dangerous illness indeed. <clears throat> the pneumonia patient on about the fourth or fifth day would invariably reach what was known as the crisis. The temperature soared and the pulse became rapid. The patient had to fight to survive. My father refused to fight. He was thinking, I'm quite sure, of his beloved daughter and he was wanting to join her in heaven. So, he died. He was 57 years old. My mother had now lost a daughter and a husband all in the space of a few weeks. Heaven knows what it must have felt like to be hit with a double catastrophe like this. Here she was, a young Norwegian in a foreign land, suddenly having to face all alone the very gravest problems and responsibilities. She had five children to look after, three of her own and two by her husband's first wife, and to make matters worse, she herself was expecting another baby in two months' time. A less courageous woman would almost suddenly have sold the house and packed her bags and headed straight to Norway with the children. Over there, in, the, in her own country, she had her mother and father willing and waiting to help her, as well as a, her two unmarried sisters, but she refused to take the easy way out. Her husband had always stated most emphatically that he wished all children to be educated in English schools. They were the best in the world, he used to say, better by far than the Norwegian ones better even than the Welsh ones, despite the fact that he lived in Wales and he had his business there. He maintained that there was some kind of magic about English schooling which had caused the inhabitants of a small island to become a great nation and a great empire and to produce the world's greatest literature. No child of mine, he kept saying, is going to school anywhere else but in England. My mother was determined to carry out the wishes of her desert husband. To accomplish this, she would have to move house from Wales to England, but she wasn't ready for that yet. She must stay here in Wales for a while longer, where she knew people who could help and advise her, especially her husband's great friend and partner, Mr. Addison. 
And even if she wasn't leaving Wales quite yet, it was essential that she move to a smaller and more manageable house. She had enough children to look after without having to bother about a farm as well. So as soon as her fifth child, another daughter, was born, she sold the big house and moved to a smaller one a few miles away in Landa. It was called Cumberland Lodge, and it was nothing more than a pleasant, medium-sized suburban villa. So it was in Landaf two years later, when I was six years old, that I went to my first school. The school was a kindergarten run by two sisters, Mrs. Corfield and Miss Tucker, and it was called Elm Tree House. It is astonishing how little one remembers about one's life before the age of seven or eight. I can tell you all sorts of things that happened to me from eight onwards, but only very few before that. I went for a whole year to Elm Tree House, but I cannot even remember what my classroom looked like. Nor can I picture the faces of Mrs. Corfield or Miss Tucker, although I am sure they were sweet and smiling. I do have a blurred memory of sitting on the stairs and trying over and over again to tie one of my shoelaces, but that is all that comes back to me at this dis distance of the school itself. On the other hand, I can remember very clearly the journeys I made to and from the school because they were so tremendously exciting. Great excitement is probably the only thing that really interests a six-year-old boy and it sticks in his mind. In my case, the excitement centered around my new tricycle. I rode to school on it every day with my eldest sister riding on hers. No grown-ups came with us and I can remember oh so vividly how the two of us used to go were racing at enormous tricycle speeds down the middle of the road and then most glorious of all. When we came to a corner, we would lean to one side and take it on two wheels. All this, you must realize, was in the good old days when the sight of a motor car on the street was an event and it was quite safe for tiny children to go tricycling and go whooping their way to school in the center of the highway. So much then for my memories of kindergarten 62 years ago. It's not much, but it's all there is left. Landaf Cathedral School 1923 to 1925, age 7 to 9. Chapter 1 The Bicycle and the Sweet Shop. When I was 7, my mother decided I should leave kindergarten and go to a proper boys' school. By good fortune, there existed a well known preparatory school for boys about a mile from our house. It was, it was called Landaf Cathedral School, and it stood right under the shadow of Landaf Cathedral. Like the cathedral, the school is still there and still flourishing. But here again, I can remember very little about the two year, years I attended Landaf Cathedral School between the age of seven and nine. Only two moments remain clearly in my mind, but the first lasted no more then five seconds, but I will never forget it. It was my first term and I was walking home alone across the village green after school when suddenly one of the senior 12-year old boys came riding full speed down the road on his bicycle about 20 yards away from me. The road was on a hill and the boy was going down the slope and as he flashed by, he, he started he started backpedaling very quickly so that the freewheeling mechanism of his bike made a loud roaring sound. At the same time, he took his hands off the handlebars and folded them casually across his chest. I stopped dead and stared after him. How wonderful he was! How swift and brave and graceful in his long trousers with bicycle clips around them and his scarlet school cap at a jaunty angle on his head. One day, I told myself, one glorious day, I will have a bike like that and I will wear 
long trousers with bicycle clips and my school cap will say Shanti on my head and I will go whizzing down the hill pedaling backwards with no hands on the handlebars. I promise you that if somebody had caught me by the shoulder at that moment and said to me, What is your greatest wish in life, little boy? What is your absolute um, ambition? To be a doctor, a fine magician, a painter, a writer, or the Lord Chancellor? I would have answered without hesitation that my only ambition, my hope, my longing was to have a bike like that and go whizzing down the hill with no hands on the handlebars. It would be fabulous. It made me it made me tremble just to think about it. My second and only other memory of Landaff Cathedral School is extremely bizarre. It happened a little over a year later when I was just nine. But then I had made some friends and when I walked to school in the mornings I would start out alone but would pick up a four of others boys of my own age along the way. After school was over, the same four boys and I would set out together across the village green and through the village itself, heading for home. On the way to school and on the way back, we always passed the sweet shop. No, we didn't. We never passed it. We always stopped. We lingered outside its rather small windows, gazing in at the big glass jars full of bullseyes and old-fashioned humbugs and strawberry bonbons and glacier mints and acid drops and pear drops and, and lemon drops and all the rest of them. Each of us received six pence a week for pocket money and whenever there was any money in our pockets we would all troop in together to buy a penny worth of this or that my own favorites were sherbet suckers and licorice bootlaces one of the other boys whose name was Thwaites told me I should never eat licorice bootlaces Thwaites mother who was a doctor had said that they were made from rat's blood. The father had given his son a lecture about licorice bootlaces when he had caught him eating one in bed. Every rat catcher, every rat catcher in the country, the father had said, takes his rats to the licorice bootlace factory, and the manager pays tuppence for each rat. Many a rat catcher has become a millionaire by selling his dead rats to the factory. But how did he turn the rats into licorice? The young Thwaites had asked his father. They wait until they've got 10,000 rats, the father had answered. Then they dump them all into a huge shiny steel cauldron and boil them up for several hours. Two men stir the bubbling cat cauldron with long poles and in the end they have a thick steaming rat stew. After that, a cruncher is lowered into the cauldron to crunch the bones, and what's left is a pulpy substance called rat mash. Yes, but how do we turn that into licorice bootlaces, Daddy? The young Thwaites had asked, and this question, according to Thwaites, had caused his father to pause and think for a few moments before he answered it. At last, he had said, the two men who were doing the storing with the long poles now put on their Wellington boots and climb into the cauldron and shovel the hot rat mash out on to a concrete floor. Then they run a steam roller of it several times to flatten it out. What is left looks like a gigantic black pancake. And all they have to do after that is to wait for it to cool and to harden so they can and cut it up into stripes to make the bootlaces. Don't ever eat them, the father had said. If you do, you'll get ratatis. What is ratatis, daddy? Young Thwaites had asked. All the rats that the rat catchers catch are poisoned with rat poison, the father had said. It's, it's the rat poison that gives you ratatis. Yes, but 
What happens to you when you catch it? Young Thwaites had asked. Your teeth become very sharp and pointed, the father answered. And a short, stumpy tail grows out of your back just above your bottom. There is no cure for ratitis. I ought to know. I'm a doctor. We all enjoyed Thwaites' story, and we made him to tell it to us many times on our walks to and from farm school. But it didn't stop any of us except Thwaites from buying licorice boot laces. At two for a penny, they were the best value in the shop. A boot lace, in case you haven't had the pleasure of handling one, is not round. It's like a flat black tape about half an inch wide. You buy it rolled up in a coil, and in those days, it used to be so long that when you unrolled it and held one end at arm's length above your head, the other end touched the ground. Sherbet suckers were also to a penny. Each sucker consisted of a yellow cardboard tube filled with sherbet powder, and there was a hollow licorice straw sticking out of it. Rat's blood again. Young Thwaites would warn us, pointing at the licorice straw. You sucked the sherbet up through the straw, and when it was finished, you ate the licorice. They were delicious, those sherbet suckers. The sherbet fizzed in your mouth, and if you knew how to do it, you could make white froth come out of your nostrils and pretend you were throwing a fit. Gobstoppers, costing a penny each, were enormous hard round balls the size of small tomatoes. One gobstopper would provide about an hour's worth of non-stop sucking, and if you took it out of your mouth and inspected it every five minutes or so, you would find it ha- it has changed color. There was something fascinating about the way it went from pink to blue to green to yellow. We used to wonder how in the world the gobstopper factory managed to achieve this magic. How does it happen? We would ask each other. How can they make it keep changing color? It's your, sp- it's your spit that does it, young Thwaites proclaimed. As the son of a doctor, he considered himself to be an authority on all things that had to do with the body. He could tell us about scabs and when they were ready to be pegged off. He knew why a black eye was blue and why blood was red. It's your spit that makes a cop stopper change color, he kept insisting. When we asked him to elaborate on this theory, he answered, He wouldn't understand if I did tell you. Pear drops were exciting because they had a dangerous taste. They smelled of nail varnish and they froze the back of your throat. All of us were warned against eating them, and the result was that we ate them more than ever. There, then there was a hard brown lozenge called the tonsil tickler. The tonsil tickler tasted and smelled very strongly of chloroform. We had not the slightest doubt that these things were saturated in the dreaded, dreaded anesthetic which, as Thwaites had many times pointed out to us, could put you to sleep for hours at a stretch. If my father has to saw off, saw off somebody's leg, he said, he pours chloroform onto a pad and the person sniffs it and goes to sleep, and my father saws his leg off without him even feeling it. But why do they put it into sweets and sell them to us? We asked him. You might think a question like this would baffle, would have baffled Thwaites, but Thwaites was never baffled. My father says tonsil ticklers were invented for dangerous p- prisoners in jail, he said. They give them one with each meal and the chloroform makes them sleepy and stops them from rioting. Yes, he said, but why sell them to children? It's a plot, Thwaites said. It's a grown-up plot to keep us quiet. The sweet shop in Landaf in the e- year 1923 was the very center of our lives. To us, it was what is a bar to a drunk or a church is to a bishop. Without it, there would have been little to live for. But it had one terrible drawback, this sweet shop. 
the woman who owned it was a horror. We hated her, and we had a good reason for doing so. Her name was Mrs. Pratchett. She was a small, skinny old hag with a mustache on her upper lip and a, a mouth as sore as a green gooseberry. She never smiled. She never welcomed us when we went in. And the only times she spoke were when she said things like, I'm watching ya. So keep your thieving fingers off me them chocolates. Or, I don't want dear and dear just to look around. Either your fork's out or you gets out. But by far the most loathsome thing about Mrs. Pratchett was the filth that clung around her. Her apron was gray, gray and greasy. Her blouse had bits of breakfast all over it, toast crumbs and tea stains and splotches of dried egg yolk. It was her hands, however, that disturbed us most. They were disgusting. They were black with dirt and grime. It looked as though they had been putting lumps of coal on that fire all day long. And do not forget, please, that it was these very hands and fingers that she plunged into the sweet jars when we asked for a pennyworth of triacle toffee or wine gums or nut clusters or whatever. There were precious few health laws in those days, and nobody, least of all Mrs. Pratchett, ever thought of using a little shovel for getting out the sweets as they do today. They, the mere sight of the her grimy right hand with its black fingernails digging an ounce of chocolate fudge out of a jar would have caused a starving tramp to go running from the shop, but not us. Sweets were our lifeblood. We would have put up with far worse than that to get them. So we simply stood and watched in sullen silence, while this disgusting old woman stirred around inside the jars with her foul fingers. The other thing we hated Mrs. Pratchett for was her meanness. Unless you spent a whole sixpence all in one go, she wouldn't give you a bag. Instead, you got the sweets twisted up in a smoke piece of newspaper which she tore off up from a pile of old daily mirrors lying on the counter. So you can tell we, and you can well understand that we had it in for Mrs. Pratchett in a big way, but we didn't quite know what to do about it. Many schemes were put forward, but none of them was any good. None of them, that is, until suddenly. One memorable afternoon, we found the dead mouse. Chapter 2 The Great Mouse Plot My four friends and I had come across a loose floorboard at the desk of, at the back of the classroom. And when we prized it up with the blade of a pocket knife, he discovered a big hollow space underneath. This, we decided, would be our secret hiding place for sweets and other small treasures, such as conkers and monkey nuts and bird's eggs, etc. Every afternoon, when the last lesson was over, the five of us would wait until the classroom had emptied. Then we would lift up the floorboard and examine our secret hoard, perhaps adding to it or taking something away. One day, when we lifted it up, he found a dead mouse lying among, among our treasures. It was an exciting discovery. Thwaites took it out by its tail and waved it in front of our faces. What shall we do with it? He cried. It stinks, someone shouted. Throw it out of the window, quick! Hold on a tick, I said. Don't throw it away. Thwaites hesitated. They all looked at me. When writing about oneself, one must strive to be truth truthful. Truth is more important than modesty. I must tell you, therefore, that it was I, and I alone, who had the idea for the great, daring mouse plot. We all have our moments of brilliance and glory, and this was mine. Why don't we, I said, slip it into one of Mrs. Pratchett's jar of sweets? Then, when she puts a dirty hand in to grab a handful, she'll grab a stinky dead mouse instead. The other four stared at me in wonder. 
Then, as the sheer genius of the plot began to sink in, they all started grinning. They slapped me on the back, they cheered me and danced around the classroom. We'll do it today, they cried. We'll do it on the way home. You had the idea, they said to me. So you can be the one to put the mouse in the drawer. Thwaites handed me the mouse. I put it into my pocket, trouser pocket. Then the five of us left the school, crossed the village green, and headed for the sweet shop. We were tremendously jazzed up. We felt like a gang of desperado, desperados sitting out to rob a train or blow up the sheriff's office. Make sure you put it into a drawer which is used often, somebody said. I'm putting it in gobstoppers, I said. The gobstopper drawer is never behind the counter. I've got a penny, Twitch said. So I'll ask for one sherbet stucker and one bootlace. And while she turns away to get them, you will slip the mouse in quickly with the gobstoppers. Thus, everything was arranged and we were strutting a little as we entered the shop. We were the victors now and Mrs. Pratchett was the victim. She stood behind the counter and her small malignant pig eyes watched us suspiciously as we came forward. One sherbet sucker please, Thwait said to her holding out this penny. I kept to the rear of the group and when I saw Mrs. Pratchett turn her head away for a couple of seconds to fish a sherbet sucker out of the box, lifted the heavy glass lid of the gobstopper jar and dropped the mouse in. Then I replaced the lid as silently as possible. My heart was thumping like mad and my hands had gone all sweaty. And one bootlace, please, I heard Thwaites saying. When I turned around, I saw Mrs. Pratchett holding out the bootlace in her filthy fingers. I don't want the, a lot of all oh, you dropping in the air. If only one of you is buying, she screamed at us. Now beat it! Go on! Get out! As soon as we were outside, we broke into a run. Did you do it? They shouted at me. Of course I did, I said. Well done, you! They cried. What a super show! I felt like a hero. I was a hero. It was marvelous to be so popular. Chapter 3 Mr. Coombs the flush of triumph over the dead mouse was carried forward to the next morning as we all met again to walk to school. Let's go and in and see if it's still in the drawer, somebody said as we approached the sweet shop. Don't, don't, Thwaites said firmly. It's too dangerous. Walk past as though nothing has happened. As we came level with the shop, we saw a cardboard notice hanging on the door. We stopped and stayed. We had never known the sweet shop to be closed at this time in the morning, even on Sundays. What's happened? We asked each other. What's going on? We pressed our face against the window and looked inside. Mrs. Pratchett was nowhere to be seen. Look, I cried. The gobstopper's jar's gone. It's not on the shelf. There's, ga there's a gap where it used to be. It's on the floor, someone said. It's smashed to bits and there's gong stoppers everywhere. That's the mouse, someone else shouted. We could see it all. The huge glass jar smashed to, to smithereens with the dead mouse lying in the wreckage and hundreds of many colored gong stoppers littering the floor. She got such a shock when she grabbed hold of that mouse that she dropped everything, somebody was saying. But why didn't she sweep it all up and open the shop? I asked. Nobody answered me. We turned away and walked towards the school. All of a sudden, we had begun to feel slightly uncomfortable. There was something not quite right about the shop being closed. Even Thwaites was unable to offer a reasonable explanation. We became silent. There was a faint scent of danger in the air now. Each one of us had caught a whiff of it. 
Alarm bells were beginning to ring faintly in our e- ears. After a while, Fleets broke the silence. She must have got one heck of a shock, he said. He paused. We all looked at him, wondering what wisdom the great medical authority was going to come out with next. After all, he went on, to catch hold of a dead mouse when you're expecting to catch hold of a gobstopper must be pretty frightening experience. Don't you agree? Nobody answered him. Well now, Dwight went on. Dwight went on. When an old person like Mrs. Pratchett suddenly gets a very big shock, I suppose you know what happens next. What? We said. What happens? You ask my father, Dwight said. He'll tell you. You tell us, we said. It gives her a heart attack, Dwight announced. Her heart stops beating and she's dead in five seconds. For a moment or two, my own heart stopped beating. Dwight pointed a finger at me and said darkly, I'm afraid you have killed her. Me? I cried. Well, why just me? It was your idea, he said. And what's more, you put the mouse in. All of a sudden, I was a murderer. At exactly the point, we heard the school bell ringing in the distance and we had to go up the rest of the way so as not to be late for prayers. Prayers were held in the assembly hall. We all perched in rows on wooden benches while the teachers sat up on the platform in armchairs facing us. The five of us scrambled into our places just as the headmaster marched in, followed by the rest of the staff. The headmaster is the only teacher at Landaff Cathedral School that I can remember. And for a reason, you will discover soon. I can remember him very clearly indeed. His name was Mr. Coombs. And I have a picture in my mind of a giant man with a face like a ham and a mass of rusty colored hair that sprouted in a tangle all over the top of his head. All grown-ups appear as giants to small children, but headmasters and policemen are the biggest giants of all and acquire a marvelously exaggerated stature. It is possible that Mr. Coombs was a perfectly normal being, but in my memory, he was a giant. A tweed-suited giant who always wore a black gown over his tweeds and a waistcoat under his jacket. Mr. Coombs now proceeded to mumble through the same old prayers we had every day. But this morning, when the last Amen had been spoken, he did not return and lead his group rapidly out of the hall as usual. He remained standing before us, and it was clear he had an announcement to make. The whole school is to go out and line up around the playground immediately, he said. Leave your books behind and no talking. Mr. Coombs was looking grim. His hammy pink face had taken on that dangerous scowl which only appeared when he was extremely cross and somebody was for the high jump. I sat there small and frightened among the rows and rows of other boys. And to me, at that moment, the headmaster, with his black gown draped over his shoulders, was like a judge at a murder trial. He's after the killer, the waits whispered to me. I began to shiver. I bet the police are already here, the waits went on, and the black Maria's waiting outside. As we made our way out to the playground, My whole stomach began to feel as though it was slowly filling up with swirling water. I'm only eight years old, I told myself. No little boy of eight has ever murdered anyone. It's not possible. Out in the playground on this warm, cloudy September morning, the deputy headmaster was shouting, Line up in farms, sixth form over there, fifth form next to them, spread out, spread out, get out of it, and stop talking, all of you! Thwaites and I and my other three friends were in the second form, the lowest but one, and we lined up against the red brick wall of the playground shoulder to shoulder. And I can remember that when every boy in the school was in his place, the line stretched right about around the 
four sides of the playground, about 100 small boys altogether, aged between 6 and 12. All of us wearing identical grey shorts and grey blazers and grey stockings and black shoes. Stop that talking! shouted the deputy head. I want absolute silence! But why for heaven's sake were we in the playground at all? I wondered. And why were we linked up like this? It had never happened before. I half expected to see two policemen come bounding out of the school to grab me by the arms and put handcuffs on my wrists. A single door led out from the school onto the playground. Suddenly it st- swung open and through it, like the angel of death, strode Mr. Coombs, huge and bulky in a sweet suit, suit and black gown, and beside him, Believe it or not, right beside him trotted the tiny figure of Mrs. Pratchett herself. Mrs. Pratchett was alive. She, the relief was tremendous. She's alive, I whispered to Thwaites standing next to me. I didn't kill her. Thwaites ignored me. Well, start over here, Mr. Coombs was saying to Miss, Mrs. Pratchett. He gra- grasped her by one of her skinny arms and led her over where the sixth form was standing. Then, still keeping hold of her arm, he proceeded to lead her at a brisk wall down the line of boys. It was like someone inspecting the troops. What on earth are they doing? I whispered. Twitch didn't answer me. I glanced at him. He had gone. He had gone rather pale. Too big, I heard Mrs. Pratchett say. Much too big. It's none of this lot. Let's have a look at some of those ditchy ones. Mr. Coombs increased his pace. We'd better go all the way around, he said. He seemed in a hurry to get it over with now, and I could see Mrs. Pratchett's skinny goat's legs trotting to keep up with him. They had already inspected one side of the playground where the sixth form and the half of the fifth form were standing. We watched them moving down the second side, then the third side. Still too big, I heard Mrs. Pratchett croaking. Much too big, smaller than these, much smaller. Where's them nasty little ones? They were coming closer to us now, closer and closer. They were stare trotting on the fourth side. Every boy in our form was watching Mr. Coombs and Mrs. Pratchett as they came walking down the line towards us. Nasty cheeky lot, these little uns. I heard Miss I heard Mrs. Pratchett muttering. They comes into my shop and they think they can do what they damn well likes. Mr. Coombs made no reply to this. They nick things when I ain't looking. She went on. They put their grubby hands all over the everything and they've got no manners. I don't mind girls. I never have no trouble with girls. But boys is hideous and horrible. I don't have to tell you that, Edmaster, do I? These are the smaller ones, Mr. Coombs said. I could see Mrs. Pratchett's piggy little eyes start staring hard at the face of each boy as she passed. Suddenly, she let out a high-pitched yell and pointed at a dirty finger straight at Thwaites. That's him, she yelled. That's one of them. I know him a mile away, that scummy little bounder. The entire school turned to look at Thwaites. What have I done? He stuttered, appealing to Mr. Coombs. Shut up. Shut up, Mr. Coombs said. Mrs. Pratchett's eyes flicked over and settled on my own face. I looked down and studied the back black asphalt sp- surface of the playground. Here's another one of them, I heard her yelling. That's one there. She was pointing at me now. You're quite sure? Mr. Coombs said. Of course I'm sure, she cried. I never forget a face, least of all when it's as sly as that. Here's one of them, all right. There was five altogether. Now where's them the other three? The other three, as I knew very well, were coming up next. 
Mrs. Pratchett's face was glimmering with venom as her eyes traveled beyond me down the line. There they are! She cried out, stabbing the air with her finger. Im and im and im! That's five of them, all right? We don't need to look no farther than this, Edmaster. They're all here. The nasty, dirty little pigs! You've got their names, have you? I've got their names, Mrs. Pratchett, Mr. Coombs told her. I'm much obliged to you. And I'm much obliged to you, Edmaster, she answered. As Mrs. Mr. Coombs led her away across the playground, we heard her saying, Right in the jaw of gobstoppers it was, a stinking dead mouse which I will never forget as long as I live. You have my deepest sympathy, Mr. Coombs was muttering. Talk about sharks, she went on. When my fingers got hold of that nasty, soggy, stinking dead mouse. Her voice trailed away as Mr. Coombs led her quickly through the door into the school building. Chapter 4 Mrs. Pratchett's Revenge Our form headmaster came into the classroom with a piece of paper in his hand. The following are to report to the headmaster's study at once, he said. Thwaites, Dell, and then he read out the other three names which I have forgotten. The five of us stood up and left the room. We didn't speak as we made our way down the long corridor into the headmaster's private quarters, where the dreaded study was situated. Thwaites knocked on the door. Enter! We settled in. The room smelled of leather and tobacco. Mr. Coombs was standing in the middle of it, dominating everything. A giant of a man, if ever there was one. And in his hands, he held a long yellow cane, which curved round the top like a walking stick. I don't want any lies, he said. I know very well you did it, and you were all in it together. Line up over there against the bookcase. We lined up, Thwaites in front, and I, for some reason, at the very back. I was last in the line. You, Mr. Coombs said, pointing the cane at Thwaites. Come over here. Thwaites went forward very slowly. Bend over, Mr. Coombs said. Thwaites bent over. Our eyes were riveted on him. We were hypnotized by it all. We knew, of course. That boys got the cane now and again, but we had never heard of anyone being made to watch. Tighter, boy, tighter, Mr. Coombs snapped out. Touch the ground. Thwaites touched the carpet with the tips of his fingers. Mr. Coombs stood back and took a firm stance with his legs well apart. I thought how small Thwaites' bottom looked and how very tight it was. Mr. Coombs had his eyes focused squarely upon it. He raised the cane high above his shoulder, and as he brought it down, he made a loud swishing sound, and then there was a crack like a pistol shot as it struck Thwaites' bottom. Little Thwaites seemed to lift about a foot into the air and he yelled, Ow! He straightened up like elastic. Ada! shrieked a voice from over in the corner. Now it was our turn to jump. We looked around, and there, sitting in one of Mr. Coombs' big leather armchairs, was the tiny, loathsome figure of Mrs. Pratchett. She, she was bounding up and down with excitement. Lay it into him, she was shrieking. Let him have it. Teach him a lesson. Get down, boy, Mr. Coombs ordered. And stay down. You get an extra one every time you straighten up. That's telling him, shrieked Mrs. Pratchett. That's telling him, that telling the little blighter. I could hardly believe what I was seeing. It was like some awful pantomime. The violence was bad enough and being made to watch, it was even worse. But with Mrs. Pratchett in the audience, the whole thing became nothing but a nightmare. Swish crack went the cane. Ow! yelled Thwaites. Ada! shrieked Mrs. Pratchett. 
Stitch him up. Make it sting. Tickle him up good and proper. Warm his backside for him. Go on, warm it up, Edmaster. Tweets received four strokes. And by gums, there were four real whoopers. N Next, snapped Mr. Coombs. Tweets come came hopping past us on his toes, clutching his bottom with both hands and yelling, Ow! Ouch! Ow! With tremendous reluctance, the next boy settled forward to his fate. I stood there wishing it I hadn't been last in the line. The watching and waiting were probably even greater torture than the event itself. Mr. Coombe's performance the second time was the same as the first, so was Mrs. Pratchett's. She kept her screeching all the way through, exhorting Mr. Coombe to greater and still greater efforts. And the awful thing was that he seemed to be responding to her cries. He was like an athlete who was spurred on by the shouts of the crowd in the stands. Whether this was true or not, I was sure of one thing. He wasn't weakening. My own turn came at last. My mind was swimming and my eyes had gone all blurry as I b went forward to bend over. I can remember wishing my mother would suddenly come bursting into the room shouting, Stop! How dare you do that to my son? But she didn't. All I heard was Mrs. Pratchett's dreadful high pitch to me, voice behind me, screeching, This one's the cheekiest of the blooming lot, Edmaster. Make sure you let him have it good and strong. Mr. Coombs did just that. As the first stroke landed and the pistol crack sounded, I was thrown forward so violently that my fingers hadn't been touching the carpet. I think I would have fallen flat on my face. As it was, I was able to catch myself on my palms of my hands and keep my balance. At first, I heard only the crack and felt absolutely nothing at all. But a fraction of a second later, the burning sting that flooded across my buttocks was so terrific that all I could do was gasp. I have a great gushing gasp that emptied my lungs of every breath of air that was in them. It felt, I promise you, as though someone has, had laid a hard, red hot poker against my flesh and was pressing down on it. The second stroke was worse than the first and this probably because Mr. Coombs was well practiced and had a splendid aim. He was able, so it seemed, to land the second one almost across the narrow line where the first one had struck. It is bad enough when the cane lands on fresh skin, but when it comes down on bruised and wounded flesh, the agony is unbelievable. The third one seemed even worse than the second, whether or not the willy he, Mr. Coombs had chalked the cane beforehand and had thus made an aiming mark on my grey flannel shorts. After the first stroke, I do not know. I am inclined to doubt it because he must have known that this was a practice much frowned up by headmasters in general in those days. It was not only regarded as unsporting, it was also an admission that you were not an expert at the job. By the time the fourth stroke was delivered, my entire backside seemed to be going up in flames. Far away in the distance, I heard Mr. Coombe's voice saying, Now get out! As I limped across the study, clutching my buttocks hard with both hands, a cackling sound came from the armchair over in the corner. And then I heard the vinegary voice of Mrs. Pratchett saying, I'm very much obliged to you, Edmaster. Very much obliged. I don't think we's going to see any more stinking mice in my gobstoppers from now on. When I returned to the classrooms, my eyes were wet with tears and everybody stared at me. My bottom hurt when I sat down at my desk. That evening, after supper, my three sisters had their baths before me. Then it was my turn. But as I was about to step in the bathtub, I heard a horrified gasp from my mother behind me. What's this? She gasped. What's, what's happened to you? you? She was staring at my bottom. 
I myself had not inspected it up to then. But when I twisted my head around and took a look at one of my buttocks, I saw the scarlet stripes and the deep blue bruising in between. Who, who did this? My mother cried. Tell me at once. In the end, I had to tell her the whole story. While my, my three sisters, aged nine, six, and four, stood around in their night, 90s listening Google-eyed. My mother heard me out in silence. She asked no questions. She just let me talk. And when I had finished, she said to our nurse, You get them to into bed, nanny. I'm going out. If I had the slightest idea of what she was going to do next, I would have tried to stop her. But I hadn't. She went straight downstairs and put on her hat. Then she marched out of the house, down the drive, and onto the road. I saw her through my bedroom window as she went out the gates and turned left. And I remember calling out to her to come back, come back, and come back. But she took no notice of me. She was walking very quickly with her head held high and her body erect. And by the look of things, I figured that Mr. Coombs was in for a hard time. About an hour later, my mother returned and came upstairs to kiss her all good night. I wish you hadn't done that, I said to her. It, it, it makes me look silly. They don't beat small children like that where I come from, she said. Why won't I won't allow it? What did Mr. Coombs say to you, Mama? He told me that I was a foreigner and I didn't know, understand how British schools were run, she said. Did he get ratty with you? Very ratty, she said. He told me that if I didn't like his methods, I could take you away. What did he say? I said I would. As soon as the school year is finished, I shall find you an English school this time, she said. Your father was right. English schools are the best in the world. Does that mean it'll be a boarding school? I asked. It'll have to be, she said. I'm not quite ready to move the whole family to England yet. So I stayed on at Landaff Cathedral School until the end of the summer term. Chapter 5 Going to Norway The summer holidays! Those magic words! The mere mention of them used to send shivers of joy rippling over my skin. All my summer holidays from when I was 4 years old to when I was 17, that is 1920-1932, were totally idyllic. This, I am certain, was because we always went to the same idyllic place and that place was Norway. Except for my ancient half-sister and my not-so-quite ancient half-brother, the rest of us were all pure Norwegian blood. We all spoke Norwegian and all our relations lived over there. So in a way, going to Norway every summer was like going home. Even the journey was an event. Do not forget that there were no commercial airplanes in those times. So it took us four whole days to complete the trip out and another four days to get home again. We were always an enormous party. They were my three sisters and my ancient half-sisters, that's four, and my half-brother and me, that's six, and my mother, that's seven, and nanny, that's eight, and in addition to this, there were never less than two others who were some sort of anonymous ancient friends of the ancient half-sister, and that's ten altogether. Looking back on it now, I don't know how mother did it. There were all those train bookings and boat bookings and hotel bookings to, make it to be made in advance by letter. She had to make sure that we had enough shorts and shirts and sweaters and gym shoes and bathing costumes. They couldn't even buy a shoelace on the island where we were going to. And the packing must have been a nightmare. Six huge trunks were carefully packed as well as countless suitcases and when the great departure day arrived, the ten of us, together with our mountains of luggage, would set out on the first and easiest step of the journey, the train to London. When we arrived in London, we tumbled into three taxis and went 
sauntering across the great city to King's Cross, where we got onto the train for Newcastle, nearly 300 miles to the north. The trip to Newcastle took about five hours, and when we arrived there, we needed three more taxis to take us from the station to, to the docks, where our boat would be waiting. The next stop after that would be Oslo, the capital of Norway. When I was young, the capital of Norway was not called Oslo, it was called Christiania. But somewhere along the line, the Norwegians decided to do away with that pretty name and call it Oslo instead. As children, we always knew it as Christiania. But if I call it that tier, we shall only get confused, so I'd better stick to Oslo all through the way. The sea journey from Newcastle to Oslo took two days and a night, and if it was rough as it often was, all of us got seasick except our dauntless mo mother. We used to lie in deck chairs on the prominent deck within easy reach of the rails, embalmed in rugs, our faces laid grey and our stomachs churning, refusing the hot soup and chips biscuits the kindly steward kept offering us. And as for poor Nanny, she began to feel sick the moment she set foot on deck. I hate these things, she used to say. I'm sure we'll never get there. Which lifeboat do we go to when it starts to sink? Then she would retire to her cabin, where she strayed groaning and trembling until the ship was firmly tied up at the quayside in Oslo Harbor the next day. We always stopped off for one night in Oslo so that we could have a grand annual family reunion with our bestie mama and bestie papa, our mother's parents, and with her two maiden sisters, our aunts, who lived in the same house. When we got off the boat, we all went in a cavalcade of taxis straight to the Grand Hotel, where we would sleep one night to drop off our luggage. Then, keeping the same taxis, we drove on to the grandparents' house, where an emotional welcome awaited us. All of us were embraced and kissed many times, and tears flowed down red, wrinkled old cheeks, and suddenly, that quiet, gloomy house came alive with many children's voices. Ever since I first saw her, Bestie Mama was terrifically ancient. She was a white-haired, wrinkly, old-faced old bird who seemed always to be sitting in her rocking chair, rocking away and smiling beningly at this vast influx of grandchildren who barged in from miles away to take over her house for a few hours every year. Bestie Papa was the quiet one. He was a small dignified scholar with a white goatee beard. And as far as I could gather, he was an astrologer, a meteorologist, and a speaker of ancient Greek. Like Best Mama, he sat most of the time quietly in a chair, saying very little and totally overwhelmed. I imagine by the raucous rabble who were destroying his neat and polished home. The two things I remember most about Best Papa were that he wore black boots and that he smoked an extraordinary pipe. The bowl of his pipe was made of meerstrom clay and it had a flexible stem about three feet long so that the bowl rested on his lap. All the grown-ups including Nanny and all the children, even when the youngest was only a year old, sat down around the big oval dining room table on the afternoon of our arrival for the great animal celebration feast with the grandparents and the food received never varied. This was a Norwegian household, and for the Norwegians, the best food in the world is fish. And when they say fish, they don't mean the sort of thing you and I get from the fishmonger. They mean fresh fish. Fish that has been caught no more than 20 hours before and has never been froze or chilled on a block of ice. I agree with them that the proper way to prepare fish like this is to poach it. And that is what they do with the finest specimens. And Norwegians, by the way, always eat the skin of the boiled fish, 
which they say has the best taste of all. So naturally, this great celebration feast started with fish. A massive fish, a flounder as big as a tea tray and as thick as your arm was brought to the table. It had nearly black skin on top which had which was covered with brilliant orange spots and it had, of course, been perfectly poached. Large white tongues of this fish were carved out and put onto our plates and with it we had a hollandaise sauce and boiled new potatoes. Nothing else! And by gosh, it was so delicious! As soon as the remains of the fish had been cleared away, a tremendous craggy mountain of homemade ice cream would be carried in. Apart from being the creamiest ice cream in the world, the flavor was unforgettable. There were thousands of little chips of crisp burnt toffee mixed into it. The Norwegians call it krokan. And as a result, it didn't simply melt in your mouth like ordinary ice cream. You chewed it and it would crunch and the taste was something you dreamed about for days afterwards. This great feast would be interrupted by a small speech of welcome from my grandfather and the grown-ups would raise their long-stemmed wine glasses and say scal many times throughout the meal. When the guzzling was over, those who were considered old enough were given small glasses of homemade liquor a colorless but fiery drink that smelled of mulberries. The glasses were raised again and again and the scaling seemed to go on forever. In Norway, you may select any individual around the table and scale him or her in a small private ceremony. Do you first lift your glass high and call out the name like Besta Mama, you say, Skal Besta Mama. She will then lift her own glass and hold it up high. At the same time, your own eyes meet hers and you must keep looking deep into her eyes as you sip your drink. After you have both done this, you raise your glasses high up again in a sort of silent final salute and only then does each person look away and set down his glass. It is a serious and solemn ceremony and as a rule on formal occasions, everyone scales everyone else around the table once. If there are, for example, 10 people present and you are one of them, you will scale your 9 companions once each individually and you yourself will also receive 9 separate scales at different times during the meal, 18 in all. That's how they work in it in a polite society over there. At least they used to do it in the old days. And quite a business it was. By the time I was 10, I would be permitted to take part in these ceremonies and I always finished up as a tipsy, as a lord. Chapter 6 The Magic Island The next morning, everyone got up early and eager to continue the journey. There was another full day's traveling to be done before we reached our final destination, most of it by boat. So after a rapid breakfast, our cavalcade left the Grand Hotel in three more taxis and headed for Oslo Docks. There we went on board a small coastal steamer and Nanny was heard to say, I'm sure it leaks. We shall all be food for the fishes before the day is out. Then she would disappear below for the rest of the trip. We loved this part of the journey. The splendid little vessel with its single tall funnel would move out in the calm waters of the fjord and proceed at a leisurely pace along the coast, stopping every hour or so at a small wooden jetty where a group of villagers and some people would be waiting to welcome friends or to collect parcels and mails. Unless you have sailed down the Oslo Fjord like this yourself on a tranquil summer's day, you cannot imagine what it is like. It is impossible to describe the sensation of absolute peace and beauty that surrounds you. The boat weaves in and out between countless tiny islands, some with small brightly painted wooden houses on them, but many with not a house or a tree on the bare rocks. These granite rocks are so smooth that you can lie and sun yourself on them in your bathing costume without putting a towel underneath. We would see 
long-legged girls and tall boys basking on the rocks of the islands. There are no sandy beaches in the fjord. The rocks go straight down to the water's edge, and the water is immediately deep. As a result, Norwegian children all learn to swim when they are very young, because if you can't swim, it is difficult to find a place to bath. Sometimes when our little vessel slipped between two narrow islands, the channel was so narrow we could almost touch the rocks on either side. We would pass rowboats and canoes with flakes and hair children in them. Their skins browned by the sun and we would have waved to them and watched their tiny boats rocking violently in the swell that our larger ship left behind. Late in the afternoon, we would come finally to the end of the journey, the island of Tiomb. This was where our mother always took us. Heaven knows where she he found it, but to us, it was the greatest place on the earth. About 200 yards from the jetty, along a narrow, dusty road, stood a simple wooden hotel painted white. It was run by an elderly couple whose faces I still remember vividly, and every year they welcomed us like old friends. Everything about the hotel was extremely primitive, except the dining room. The walls, the ceiling, and the floor of our bedrooms were made of plain, unvarnished pine planks. There was a wash basin and a jug of cold water in each of them. The lavatories were in a rickety wooden outhouse at the back of the hotel, and each cubicle contained nothing more than a round hole cut in a piece of wood. You sat on the hole, and what you did there dropped into a pit ten feet below. If you look down the hole, you would often see rats scurrying about in the gloom. All this we took for granted. Breakfast was the best meal of the day in our hotel, and it was all laid out on a huge table in the middle of the dining room from which you helped yourself. There were maybe 50 different dishes to choose from on that table. There were large jugs of milk, which all Norwegian children drink at every meal. There were plates of cold beef, veal, ham, and pork. There was cold boiled mackerel submerged in aspic. There were spiced and pickled herring fillets, sardines, smoked eels, and cod's roe. There were large bowl piled high with hot boiled eggs. There were cold armlets with chopped ham in them and cold chickens with hot coffee for the grown-ups and hot crisp rolls baked in the hotel kitchen which we ate with butter and cranberry jam. These were stewed, there were stewed apricots and five or six different cheeses including, of course, the ever-present get tossed that tall brown rather sweet norwegian goat's cheese which you find on just about every table in the land after breakfast we collected our bathing things and the whole party all tell them, 10 of us would pile into our boat everyone has some sort of boat in norway nobody sits around in front of the hotel nor does anyone sit on the beach because there aren't any beaches to sit on in the early days, we had only a rowboat, but a very fine one it was. It carried all of us easily with places for two rowers. My mother took one pair of oars and my fairly ancient half-brother took the other, and off we would go. My mother and the half-brother, who was somewhere around 18 then, were expert rowers. They kept in perfect time and the oars went click, 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 click in their wooden rowlocks, and the rowers never paused once during the journey, the long 40 minute. The rest of us sat in the boat, trailing our fingers in the clear water and looking for jellyfish. We skimmed across the sound and went whizzing through narrow channels with rocky islands on either side, heading, as always, for a very secret tiny patch of sand on a distant island that only we knew about. In the early days, we needed a place like this where we could paddle and play about because my youngest sister was only one, the next sister was three, and I was four. 
the rocks and the deep water were no good for us. Every day for several summers, that tiny secret sand patch on that tiny secret island was our regular destination. We would stay there for three or four hours, messing about in the water and in the rock pools and getting extraordinary, some extraordinarily sunburned. In later years, when we were a, a little older and could swim, the daily routine became different. By then, my mother had acquired a motorboat, a small and not very seaworthy white wooden vessel, which sat far too low in the water and was powered by an unreliable one-cylinder engine. The fairly ancient half-brother was the only one who could make the engine go at all. It was extremely difficult to start, and he always had to unscrew the sparking plug and pour petrol into the cylinder. Then he swung the flywheel round and round with a bit of luck. After a lot of coughing and spluttering, the thing would finally get going. When we first acquired the motorboat, my younger sister was four and I was seven, and by then all of us had learned to swim. The exciting new boat made it possible for us to go much farther afield and every day we would travel far out into the fjord hunting for a different island. There were hundreds of them to choose from. Some were very small, no more than 30 yards long. The others were quite large, maybe half a mile in length. It was wonderful to have such a choice of places and it was terrific fun to explore each island before we went swimming off the rocks. There were wooden skeletons of shipwrecked boats on, the, on those islands and big white bones. Were they human bones? I don't know. And wild raspberries and muzzles clinging to the rocks and some of the islands had shaggy long-haired goats on them and sometimes even sheep. Now and again when we were out in the open water beyond the chain of islands, the sea became very rough and that was when my mother enjoyed herself most. Nobody, not even the tiny children, bothered with life belt in those days. We would cling to the sides of our funny little white motorboat, driving through mountainous white caped waves and getting drenched to the skin while my mother calmly handled the tiller. There were times, I promise you, when the waves were so high that as we slid down into a trough, the whole world disappeared from our sight. Then up and up the little boat would climb, standing almost vertically on its tail until we reached the crest of the next wave. And then it was like being on top of a foaming mountain. It requires the great skill to handle a small boat in seas like these. The thing can easily capsize or be swamped if the bows do not meet the great combing breakers at just the right angle. But my mother knew exactly how to do it, and we were never afraid. We loved every minute of it, all of us except for our long-suffering nanny, who would bury her face in her hands and call aloud upon the Lord to save her soul. In the early evenings, we would always nearly went out fishing. We collected mussels from the rocks for bait. Then we got into either the rowboat or the motorboat and pushed off to drop anchor later in some likely spot. The water was very deep and often we had to let out 200 feet of line before we touched the bottom. We would sit silent and tense waiting for a bite and it always amazed me how even a little nibble at the end of that long line would be transmitted to one's fingers. A bite, someone would shout, jerking the lion. I've got him! It's a big one! It's a whooper! And then came the thrill of falling in the line, hand over hand and peering over the side into the clear water to see how big the fish really was as he neared to the surface. Cod whiting, haddock, and mackerel we caught them all and bore them back triumphantly to the hotel kitchen where the cheery fat woman who did the cooking promised to get them ready for our supper. 
I tell you my friends, those were the days. Chapter 7 A Visit to the Doctor I have only one unpleasant memory of the summer holidays in Norway. We were in the grandparents' house in Oslo, and my mother said to me, We are going to the doctor this afternoon. He wants to look at your nose and mouth. I think I was eight at that time. What's wrong with my nose and mouth? I asked. Nothing much, my mother said. But I think you've got adenoids. What are they? I asked her. Don't worry about it, she said. It's nothing. I held my mother's hand as we walked to the doctor's house. It took us about half an hour. There was a kind of dentist stare in the surgery, and I was lifted on into it. The doctor had a round mirror straight to his forehead, and he peered up my nose and into my mouth. He then took my mother aside, and they held a whispered conversation. I saw my mother looking rather grim, but she nodded. The doctor now put some water to boil in an aluminum mug over a gas flame, and into the boiling water he placed a long, thin, shiny steel instrument. I sat there watching the steam coming off the boiling water. I was not in the least apprehensive. I was too young to realize that something out of the ordinary was going to happen. Then a nurse, dressed in white, came in. She was carrying a red rubber apron with a curved white enamel bowl. She put the apron over my front of my body and tied it around my neck. It was far too big. Then she held the enamel bowl under my chin. The curve of the bowl fitted perfectly against the curve of my chest. The doctor was bending over me. In his hand, he held that long, shiny steel instrument. He held it right in front of my face, and to this day I can still describe it perfectly. It was about the thickness and length of a pencil, and like most pencils, it had a lot of sides to it. Towards the end, the metal became much thinner, and at the very end of the thin bit of metal, there was a tiny blade set at an angle. The blade was more than a centimeter long. Very small, very sharp, and very sharp, shiny. Open your mouth, the doctor said, speaking Norwegian. I refused. I thought he was going to do something to my teeth, and everything anyone had ever done to my teeth had been painful. It won't take two seconds, believe me, the doctor said. He spoke gently, and I was seduced by his voice. Like an ass, I opened my mouth. The tiny blade flashed in the bright light and disappeared into my mouth. It went high up into the roof of my mouth, In the hand that held the blade gave four or five very quick little twists, and next moment, out of my mouth, into the basin came tumbling a whole mass of flesh and blood. I was too shocked and outraged to do anything but yelp. I was horrified by the huge red lumps that had fallen out of my mouth into the white basin. And my first thought was that the doctor had cut the hole of the middle of my head. Those were your adenoids, I heard the doctor saying. I sat there grasping. The roof of my mouth seemed to be on fire. I grabbed my mother's hand and held on it to it tight. I couldn't believe that anyone would do this to me. Stay where you are, the doctor said. You'll be all right in a minute. Blood was still coming out of my mouth and dripping into the basin the nurse was holding. Spit it all out, she said. There's a good boy. You'll be able to breathe much better through your nose after this, the doctor said. The nurse wiped my lips and washed my face with a wet flannel. Then they left, lifted me out of the chair and stood me on my feet. I felt like a bit groggy. Well, get, get you home, my mother said, taking my hand. Down the stairs we went and onto the street. We started walking. I said, walking. No trolley car or taxi. We walked the full half hour journey back to the, my grandparents' house. And when we arrived at last, I can remember as clearly as anything my grandmother saying, let him sit down in the chair and rest for a while. 
After all, he's had an operation. Someone placed a chair for me beside my grandmother's armchair, and I sat down. My grandmother reached over and covered one of my hands in both of hers. That won't be the last time you'll go to the doctor in your life, she said. And with a bit of luck, they wouldn't do any harm, too much harm. That was in 1924, and taking out of a child's out a child's adenoids and often the tonsils as well, without any anesthetic was common practice in those days. I wonder though, what would you think if some doctor did that to you today?